So let's get started. I want to thank you all for being here this morning. My name is Elizabeth Aloni and I'm with Schneps Media. We're the largest local media outlet with over 70 newspapers, magazines, websites, webinars, podcasts, and events across New York City, Queens, Manhattan, Brooklyn, the Bronx, Westchester, and Long Island. Today we have a wonderful event for you, the MTA on New York City Transit and New York City's reopening. I'm going to turn it over now to Robert Hozeriki, who is the editor-in-chief of AM New York Metro, amnewyork.com, The Villager, Chelsea Now, Manhattan Express, and Downtown Express. Thanks so much for being here, Robert. All right, thank you. Uh, I want to thank uh, Pat Foy and Sarah Feinberg for being here. I want to welcome all of you who are joining us for the webinar today. Uh, focus on the New York City transit and the recovery during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so here with us today are MTA Chair and CEO Pat Foy and Acting New York City Transit President Sarah Feinberg. Uh, welcome again. Uh, the MTA is playing an important role in the recovery of New York City during the pandemic for obvious reasons. They run the biggest public transit system in the country. Subways and buses, as uh, Chairman Foy described recently, are the circulatory system for the entire city and region. It's been moving since the pandemic hit, but the challenge has not only been to move the workers as re they return to their place of businesses, but also to keep the entire system clean and safe for all. Um, the, the MTA has also taken a staggering economic hit as the ridership fell during the pandemic, and they're working now to find a way to recover. So today we're gonna find out what the MTA is doing to keep the system safe, and keep riders moving while also working to recover along with the city. So uh, we'll begin with some brief remarks. Uh, Chairman Foy, you wanna begin? Yes, uh, Rob, thanks to AM New York and to you for allowing Sarah and I this opportunity to talk with uh, uh, your readers and uh, viewers. Uh, as you know, phase one uh, of the governor's New York on pause in New York City began Monday, uh, June 8th, following our announcement on the Friday before of a 13 point action plan for a, uh, for a safe return. Safety public health has been the guiding principle that the MTA has taken since the pandemic first arrived in New York March 1st when the first case was reported. A couple of days later, we began disinfecting subway cars, buses, stations, Long Island Railroad and Metro North cars. And obviously that's been ramped up uh, substantially uh, as the pandemic uh, continued. And we'll talk about that in, in some details. Reopening uh, represents a major milestone for the MTA. And frankly, it's fair to say for the city of New York, uh, customers are returning to the system, uh, I, I think with, uh, with, with confidence. Uh, the city is beginning to uh, uh, emerge from the, uh, from the pandemic uh, restrictions of New York uh, on pause. Our customers listened to the directives of Governor Cuomo in New York on pause, and that accounted for a significant drop in ridership. Uh, it's not, it's unusual for someone at the MTA like me or Sarah to be rooting for a decline in ridership, but we were because of the public health considerations uh, as, as the governor articulated those. The uh, return uh, that started Monday, uh, last uh, June 8th, a uh, week ago Monday uh, has been extraordinarily well executed. Credit to Sarah Feinberg, Craig Cipriano, Sal Sally LeBrayer and their teams who've done an outstanding job at transit. S same kudos to Phil Lang and Kathy Rinaldi at Long Island Railroad and Metro North respectively. Ridership has increased on Friday. It was on the subways, it was nearly 900,000. That's roughly 17% mm -hmm. of our normal total ridership on the subways. On buses, uh, it's around 970,000 riders, or about 43% of our normal ridership. Surprisingly, people have more people have been more customers have been riding the buses than the subways. Although we expect those mm. lines to cross uh, shortly. Uh, in terms of ridership, we're right where we expected to be. We estimated phase one projections for bus, bus and subway ridership for each of the state and regions for uh, phases of opening, uh, and and we're right on that, if not a little bit ahead. Uh, for phase two, ridership could return, we believe, to 25 to 40 percent of normal ridership on the subways and up to 50 percent on buses. Phase three, when that happens, we anticipate up to 50 percent normal ridership on subways and buses up to 60 percent. And then on phase four, our pr projections show that we could be at 70 percent of pre-pandemic 
ridership on the subways and up to 80% uh, on buses. Uh, we're all rooting for that gradual increase in ridership and obviously the return of customers on subways and, and buses will be a, both a manifestation of the increasing uh, vigor of the New York City and regional uh, economy uh, and, and also will have significant economic, positive economic consequences for the whole city, region, state, and it's fair to say, uh, nation. We've gotten incredible feedback on the cleanliness of our stations. As I mentioned, we began disinfecting, not cleaning, but disinfecting stations uh, March 3rd. Transit did a study of about 20, a survey rather, of about 20,000 of our riders, and 70% of those surveyed said that they had never seen the stations and, and, and subway cars as clean as they are now. That, that, that's good news. We want to drive that number up, but we also want to continue to disinfect the stations that protects the public and minimizes public health risk to our customers and our employees. And that's our, 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 our first priority. Uh, we're leveraging new technology across the system, including in disinfecting. <clears throat> we worked with uh, Dr. David Brenner from Columbia University's Irving Medical Center, and he was the first to confirm that ultraviolet C light, which has a long tradition and history of being used in hospital emergency room and operating room environments, that ultraviolet C light eradicates the COVID-19 virus. That, that's really positive news, and we continue to pilot uh, antimicrobials, uh, <clears throat> which uh, there is promise that they too will eradicate the COVID-19 uh, virus and may do so for weeks and months to come. More, more news on that going forward. Uh, we're hopeful that the uh, tremendous progress that uh, the MTA and New York City Transit, Long Island Railroad and Metro North have made in the first 10 days of the uh, of phase one of uh, in, in New York City uh, will continue and the MTA is proud to have played a role. Now, let me talk briefly about the financial uh, situation of the MTA before turning it over to Sarah. One, uh, MTA is about a $17 billion uh, revenue and expense uh, operation. About half of that roughly comes from fare and toll revenue. The other half comes from a package of dedicated local, state, and regional dedicated taxes and subsidies. Both of those have been materially adversely impacted by the pandemic and by New York on, on pause, which has obviously contributed to the slowing of the spread of the virus and the flattening of the curve, but it's had significant material adverse consequences on our ridership. The ridership numbers we've reported are starting to grow, but they're growing from a very low base uh, and the, Traditionally, prior to the pandemic, we carry millions and millions of riders on subways and buses uh, every day. The decline in ridership has had a dramatic impact. We continue to seek additional federal funding. We were lucky to get fortunate to get 3.8 billion plus in the CARES Act, uh, which was signed into law. We've received significant portions of that and are receiving uh, in installments of that every uh, on a literally a weekly basis, thanks to the Federal Transit Administration for accelerating uh, those payments. But we need an additional $3.9 billion to get us through the rest of the year to offset the decline in revenues, fare and toll revenue, and the decline in those dedicated packages of state, local, and regional taxes uh, and, and subsidies. That we hired McKinsey to do a review of the impact on uh, the MTA's revenues and increased uh, expenses. Uh, and the midpoint of the McKinsey range was about $7.7 .7 billion. And the CARES uh, funding, as well as the $3.9 billion in the HEROES Act, thanks to Speaker Pelosi, uh, Senator uh, Schumer, uh, Chair Nita Lowy, Congressman uh, Hakeem Jeffries, Congressman uh, Espiat, and the entire New York delegation, thanks for their support. But we're going to need that funding to get through the remainder of the year. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll also obviously have significant uh, operating deficit issues in 2021. Uh, and will uh, require uh, ad additional support, but hopefully ridership will continue to increase and begin to shrink uh, the operating uh, deficit. The MTA's recovery is critical to the city's economy, to the regional economy, the state's economy, and the national economy, given the fact that the MTA region accounts for about 10%, nearly 10% of national GDP. 
So there can't be a full, robust economic recovery in, in the city, the state, the region, or indeed the country without the New York region recovering uh, robustly. The MTA will play a significant uh, a significant role in that. And frankly, I think it's fair to say that the national recovery would be stunted and limited uh, if, if the federal government weren't to fund the MTA's operating deficits in 2020. Uh, as a result of those operating deficits, I think it's fair to say that everything is on the table given our dire uh, financial situation. And the last thing I want to say before turning it over to Sarah is that the workforces at New York City Transit Long Island Railroad, Metro North, bridges and tunnels have done extraordinary work in the period of the pandemic. Uh, they're heroes, moving heroes. Obviously, there's been a significant impact in terms of lives lost uh, at, 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 at the MTA, and we grieve every one of those colleagues who succumbed to the virus. We, our board unanimously approved a family benefit uh, program uh, a couple of months ago, which is an appropriate acknowledgement of, of, of those losses and support to, uh, to family members uh, going forward. Uh, and the work of each of one of our operating uh, uh, employees has been extraordinary during this entire period. I'll just note one fact before turning it over to Sarah, which is that nearly 10,000 of our colleagues have returned from home quarantine. Some of those as a result of uh, infections of the COVID-19 virus, many of them because they had been in contact with uh, those who, uh, who, who were infected, but nearly 10,000 of our colleagues have returned to work. And that is one of the bases on which the increase in service that started on uh, Monday, June 8th, about 10 days ago, uh, has, been, uh, ha has, has been possible. And we thank each one of those uh, colleagues for their return. With that, I'll turn it over to Sarah. Thank you. Great, thanks, Pat. Um, so I'll just, um, Pat said, you know, went over a lot of um, important uh, pieces of this, and so I'll just, um, I'll just say a couple of additional things. You know, as we think about um, bringing people back to the service, bringing people back to the system, we're sort of thinking on about what we can do, how, what parts do we play, what what can we do to make the system as safe and clean and healthy as possible and giving riders everything that they need in order to come back to the system and feel confidence about approaching the system. And then what what is out of our control? What do we need riders to do um, for their part? And so, you know, we do our part and then we need folks to do their part as well. Um, you know, in the history of MTA, I think we've always provided safe, efficient, uh, and, you know, efficient service and an extremely safe experience, right? The only difference between now and what we've always done is now we actually need riders to, to meet us halfway and to do a little part on their own as well. So in terms of what we're doing, what our part is, first of all, service. We've gone back to regular full weekday service. We've remained closed between 1 and 5 a.m. on the subway side. But we've put as much service out there as we can. The only place where we were down on regular service was we were at about 75% bus service in Manhattan. That's because ridership was so down, was down so dramatically. We're seeing that ridership come back now. So we're going to full weekday bus service in Manhattan too. So, so even, you know, at, on day one of phase one, we were at full regular weekday service. We put as much service out there as we could and we're gonna, and we're gonna keep it out there. If we can tweak here and there, add a train, add a bus where we can, we'll do it. But for now we're at full service, which we think is really important. Second, cleaning. Our approach on cleaning um, is an all of the above approach. So we are disinfecting stations and touch points twice a day. We are cleaning every single car in our fleet multiple times a day. We're up to five, six, seven times a day, making sure those cars are disinfected and cleaned at, as much as they possibly can be. Uh, we are, um, you know, um, we have looked at the UV. We have implemented UV um, technology so that we're in a pilot program where we're using UV technology to clean our cars and stations. Um, so those are the touch points. That's also using new technology to disinfect. And then the final thing we're doing is we're making sure that air is moving throughout our system um, in a way that um, promotes um, airflow and is in line with what public health experts um, suggest. So in our cars, uh, we have air filters that are moving, that's moving air through constantly. Um, 
you know, what else can we do on our part to make sure that the system is safe? We are making sure that there, there are masks in every station and that there is um, hand sanitizer in every station. So we want to make sure we're giving riders the tools that they need to, to, um, to arm themselves and to, and to make sure that they are safe and healthy. But we also need riders to do their part as well, right? So masks are, the first thing they can do is wear a mask. Masks are absolutely uh, enforced and required. We need everyone in the system to be wearing a mask. Um, we've seen uh, massive compliance with this. So we've had folks out in the system watching, um, just monitoring, seeing who's wearing a mask and who's not so we can collect our own data, do our own analysis of, of where we are in mask compliance. Last week, or going into phase one, we were at 92% mask mm. compliance, which um, I found to be astounding, frankly, and extremely impressive. Um, we are now at 95% mask compliance. So again, these aren't just you know folks who are going and checking one or two stations. We are sending so many folks out into the station to do these out to uh, many stations to do these observations that they're seeing tens of thousands of people a day. So we feel very confident in those numbers. And 95% ma mass compliance is an important tipping point. So mm -hmm. public health officials say 70% of mass compliance is a really important tipping point to slow and stop the spread. 95%, you're basically stopping the spread in a system. And so that is um, an important place to be. And I'm incredibly gratified and grateful that our, um, that our riders have gotten us there. Um, what else can we ask of riders? You know, we've put decals and stencils down in every single one of our stations to make sure that people understand the distance um, that would be required for social distancing. We don't have an expectation and we don't think our riders have an expectation that keeping six feet of social distance is possible. I think anyone who's familiar with our system has ever <laughs> ridden on a New York City subway or bus knows that six feet of social distance is pretty impossible at almost any time of the day or night. Um, but we've made sure that those decals are down so that to the extent that you can get that social distance, you're able to do it. Um, so we would love people, you know, to the extent that they can move to a less crowded part of the platform, move to a less crowded car, you know, if the bus is packed, wait for the next one. That's all, um, you know, within your control. And while we're gonna put as much service out as possible and do everything we can on our end, that's something that riders can do, um, can do on their own. And, and then finally, adjusting their schedule. So we have, we've called on the business community and large employers in New York, please adjust your schedule, tell your workforce uh, to come in later, stay later, or come in earlier and leave earlier, stagger hours to the extent that you can, stagger days of the week that you expect the workforce to come in to the extent that you can. We know the business community is supportive of that and doing their best. That's the most important thing that we can do on our end to make sure that we're you know, flattening out the, the morning rush and the afternoon rush, lengthening those peaks so that we um, are serving the rush from you know, 5.15, 5.30 in the morning till 10 o'clock in the morning as opposed to, you know, serving that rush between 5 and 7 or 5.30 and 7.30. So again, you know, our approach is all of the above. Do everything that we can possibly do to make the system clean and safe for riders and then ask riders to do their part as well. And, um, and I look forward to taking your questions. All right. Thank you very much. So we're going to move on to the questions section here. Um, I have some prepared that... Uh, I, myself and Mark Hallam, one of our reporters, uh, came up with. We also had some questions that came in before the webinar um, from the public, so we're happy to present those as well. And if you have a question, of course, like we said at the start, uh, just leave them in the chat function and we'll see if we can get to as many as we can. We have about 40 minutes left, but we'll see what we can do. Um, so I guess the first question, Pat, I want to start with you, just talking about the, the funding issue here. Um, it was reported in Politico this morning that uh, there's a surface tra transportation bill in the House of Representatives, which the MTA is said to oppose. The uh, Politico had reported that while the public transit funding in that, in that bill would increase by 50%, there's concern about penalties related to it. Could you explain that a, a little bit as to whether that's accurate or not? Yeah, here's the uh, underlying inequity. Uh, the MTA carries 40% of uh, mass transit riders in the country. And in federal funding formulas over a period of years, the MTA share of that funding has declined from over 20% to 15 today. Hmm. Perpetuating that inequity, especially in these times, we believe is, uh, is inappropriate. 
The invest bill that was put forward by Chairman DeFazio of the chairman, uh, chairman of the TNI Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, th th there's much to commend in that bill and he's to be commended, the chairman's to be commended for his leadership. But the continuation of this historic inequity uh, is, uh, is adverse to the interests of our customers. It's adverse to the interests, the financial interests, uh, financial goals of, of the MTA. And while we commend much in the bill, the continuation of that historic inequity, uh, we believe ought to, be, ought to be addressed at this time. Right. Um, you had mentioned also, uh, Pat, about uh, the, the need for the th extra 3.9 billion to get through the rest of the year. And the HEROES Act has been kind of stuck in the Senate. It hasn't really moved anywhere at this point. And there's questions as to whether that will happen. So uh, could you elaborate on perhaps a contingency plan or uh, that the NTA might be considering it if that funding doesn't come through? Well, look, it, it first, uh, uh, Rob, it, it, it is critical that that funding be passed. Uh, obviously, uh, Speaker Pelosi and the New York delegation and Senator Schumer uh, are to be commended for their work on, on, the, on the CARES Act and the passage of the HEROES Act in the, in, in the House. Right, right now, what we're focused on is doing everything we can to advance passage of the, of the HEROES Act. Obviously, state and local governments around the country need additional funding, and then Governor Cuomo has been clear about the criticality of that for the state of New York. Uh, but that is also true with respect to the MTA, so we are focused on getting that funding. Uh, our labor partners uh, have been uh, unbelievably helpful uh, partners, both on the CARES Act and the, uh, and the HEROES Act. Uh, and uh, with the failure to pass the HEROES Act or something like it and have that enacted into law would have a significant material consequence uh, on the MTA. So right now, our first focus is getting the HEROES Act passed into law. Okay, very good. Um, Sarah, I wanted to ask you about the bus lanes and busways. I know you had sent a letter to Mayor de Blasio earlier in the month asking for 60 miles of new bus lanes and busway creation and across the five boroughs. And a couple of days later, he responded with about a third of that um, being created from now until the end of October. Uh, could you explain, you know, what that, that extra 40 miles means between, you know, keeping this in terms of the recovery and getting the city moving? Um, because the, the mayor had only given, you know, you about a third. You, wh what's, what's lacking here? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So obviously thrilled with the, the 20 that are moving forward. And um, we feel strongly we need the other 40. And, and Polly Trottenberg and I had a great conversation the other day about making sure that we're working together to get the 20 done, and then we'll move on to the 40. So I have no doubt that we'll get there. Look, the, the city, um, the city has, has been supportive of bus lanes and busways. We're certainly supportive of bus lanes and busways. It's the best and fastest and most efficient way to obviously to get um, all those bus riders, you know, away from congestion, you know, give them their own lanes so that they can get where they're going. Uh, and so looking forward to working with the city on it. Obviously, we would have preferred 60, but we'll take the 20 and then work together on the 40. How critical is the, is the creation of a, of a bus network? Uh, to, to the recovery of after the pandemic in terms of, uh, you know, have you identified any also, have you also identified any other like corridors across the city that where this would work? Yeah, well, look, I think um, the pandemic has been a reminder that this is important, but but a lot of that work was done, you know, even prior to the pandemic. So we've had um, busways and bus lanes, you know, priority bus lanes and busways identified for some time. We can follow up and, and share a list. I don't, obviously don't have it in front of me, but I'm happy to follow up and share a list with everyone who's interested in what our priorities are uh, on where we think those lanes and busways would make the most sense. Um, look, the city, in order to recover, um, this, folks have to come back, right? Folks have to come back to work. We want people to feel freedom of movement, the ability to go see their family, to go to church, to go visit with their friends, to go to school and to go to work. And so, um, you know, people have to feel comfortable in the system, whether it's the subway system or the bus system. And, you know, sitting on a bus for a long time, being congested, you know, stick, you know stuck in congestion, um, you know, isn't good for anybody. And so we knew that long before the pandemic and we're 
moving um, quickly and prioritizing this work, but I think this has just been a reminder that it, it has to you know, go to the front of the line. Okay, very good. Um, let's talk about the, uh, the UV program that's in place. Uh, you know, is there a potential for, for the UV disinfection program to maybe potentially replace physical cleaning of the system? I'm happy to take that. Uh, look, I think, uh, look, first of all, in order for the, the, the you want to do a baseline cleaning, um, the UV, you know, the UV light doesn't solve everything, right? Doesn't, doesn't right. like incinerate the coffee cup that's left on the subway <laughs> or, you know, clean up the, clean up the Diet Coke spill or whatever. So, so we will, look, we will always have a strong um, foundation of cleaners, the, the um, TWU cleaners that have been cleaning the system day in and day out uh, through this pandemic and particularly on this, you know, huge surge of cleaners into the system have been heroes in this and they um, they deal with, um, you know, uh, cleaning up messes every day that many of us would prefer to walk away from and they um, are heroes for doing it. And so look, we're always going to have a strong uh, core group of cleaners who are doing great work and, you know, the UV technology doesn't um, doesn't solve everything, but it's just an extra layer of disinfection. I think the pilot program is really promising. You know, if it if it um, works and if we have confidence in it, I think we could get to a point where new car orders um, have the UV technology inside the car, so it comes built into the car. So there, this isn't an added. A piece of technology that we're adding, but it comes within the car. And so that would be, I think, really promising to you. Do a baseline cleaning of the car, you walk away, the lights come on, uh, and the car is disinfected. Wow. Okay. I'm glad you mentioned new cars. This question, I don't know if, if either you or Pat want to take this one. Um, it has to do with the R179s, which have been, you know, notorious. They've had issues with from door malfunctions to sudden, sudden uncomplete cars. Um, yep. They were recently removed from the system. Could you speak to the impact that has had on subway service? And Pat, maybe you could explain as well uh, what's being done to kind of recuperate the loss from financially uh, with regards to the purchase of the cars and the repair and if they're going to be replaced. Yeah, so those who, those who have paid close attention to this issue, not just in the last couple of days, but for many months, know that um, you know, the 179 uh, fleet from Bombardier has been a fleet that's had some issues all along. So you may remember about a year ago, it was discovered that there was a problematic weld with the collision post uh, in the new cars. And then in January, uh, we recognized that there was a door issue where doors, both because of an equipment issue and a software issue, were... Um, you know, the, I think the best way to describe it is that the doors were not totally secure and, and in, in a few specific instances um, came open a couple of inches. And then this most recent issue um, involved um, a train actually separating between the sixth and seventh cars as it was pulling into a station. Um, so look, I think it's fair to say that, and, I, and I'll obviously let Pat speak for himself, but I know that we're on the same page here. We have, we have no tolerance for any kind of issue that can result in a safety risk to our passengers. Um, and so, you know, I found the, um, I was the transit chair when the weld issue was discovered. I was the transit chair when the door issue was discovered. And now I'm the president during the separation issue. And uh, it may well be that we have, you know, now discovered every issue uh, that has um, come up with this fleet, or it may be that there are issues that we have yet to discover. But, you know, I can say personally, I have lost confidence in this fleet for now. And um, I'm going to keep the fleet out of service until um, I feel confident that at, we've done everything we can to make sure that Bombardier has, um, you know, looked at potential issues, that we've brought in some experts. We announced earlier this week that we're going to bring in a panel of experts to advise us on this. I want fresh eyes, fresh thinking, and um, the absolute top folks in their field to take a look at where we are with this fleet and to give us some advice on how to move forward. It's important that we bring the fleet back into service. It's important that we be able to do so with confidence and be able to give the public confidence that these cars are safe. You know, in any large fleet, in any large order, you're going to have some, um, some, you know, small issues that arise here and there. Some of that is just in the, you know, as you know, all these cars are new products, right? And as new products come to market, you know, there are going to be issues here and there, but we have to make sure that um, there are no cars that are in service that could have any kind of potential safety issue. So, 
that's our path forward for the 179s in terms of impact to service. Luckily, we have um, enough cars that we have been able to bring some reserve cars in without any impact to service. Um, and we've got additional cars, uh, the 32 or the 42s, who we, we can bring in if, if the 32s if we need to. Uh, we haven't yet. Uh, those cars are less reliable. They're older. And so we'd like to hold them out if we can. But if we have to, we'll bring them back. There may be some impact to service at some point. So far, we haven't seen it. Uh, but even if there's an impact to service, I'm not going to bring those cars back in until we have full confidence in them. Pat, did you want to? Yeah, look, I commend, I commend Sarah for decisive action. Uh, we're on exactly the same page. Uh, the uh, R79s were, uh, were unfortunately late. Uh, we got financial compensation for that in terms of 18 additional cars. Uh, we expect to be made whole here. But the most important thing is this is an example of the MTA in New York City transit living what it says, which is safety is our first priority, safety of our customers and our employees, period. Uh, and uh, Sarah and the team will be reporting on the work of that panel going forward. But I commend the decisive action. Okay. Um, Pat, I just want to get back to some of the financial uh, impacts of this on the MTA, uh, specifically sure. with regards to the five-year capital plan going forward. Um, has the MTA reassessed whether or not it would put some projects such as the, sec the next phase of the Second Avenue subway on hold to help close the gap financially, or is there an, an, alternate, is there an alternate way? Well, look, Second Avenue subway phase two is one of our most important priorities in the new, uh, in the new capital plan. Uh, we are uh, dependent on significant federal uh, funding. Uh, which has been a source of uh, discussion between the governor and the, uh, and the White House in, in, in the past. But Second Avenue Subway Phase 2 is an extraordinarily important project. It would serve one of the most transit-dependent neighborhoods uh, in, in the city of New York. Uh, and uh, it, it, it is fundamental. Obviously, the pandemic changes everything and has had an effect on the capital plan. We announced that we were putting on pause capital projects that had not just started, but Governor Cuomo announced last week the acceleration of about $2 billion uh, in, in capital projects, including a number of ADA elevator projects, which is obviously a significant priority in, in the new capital plan and a significant first order priority uh, here at the MTA. Uh, Jano Lieber has been continuing, uh, the president of uh, MTA Construction and Development has been continuing to deliver. Uh, the L train tunnel was obviously done, uh, was was done early. Uh, the progress continues to be made on east side access, uh, on second, uh, third track, uh, and other projects throughout the system that uh, continue to move forward. Okay. Um, how, can you also talk about the impact this might have on congestion pricing? You've said before that we may not make the January 1st start date for this. Um, have you, what's your latest con correspondence with the Federal Highway Administration been like in terms of advancing an environmental review for this program? And um, you know, how soon do you think you can get congestion pricing up and running in Manhattan? Well, congestion pricing is obviously a fundamental part of, our, uh, of the $51.5 billion 2020 to 24 capital plan. The project central business district tolling, as it's formally known, can be divided into two pieces. One is the pieces that the MTA is responsible for, which is, which is design uh, and, and ultimately construction. Uh, that piece of the project is, is on time and on budget. There, there comes a point, however, where without federal action on the environmental process, we can't go any further. We, we haven't reached that point yet, but it is not that far down the road. And I want to commend my colleague, Allison DiSereno, who's the uh, responsible for Central Business District tolling. She and her team and Danny DiConcenzo, the head of TB and TA, have done an extraordinary job. The part that we're waiting for uh, from Washington, uh, US uh, DOT, uh, is a decision on the environmental process, whether it's an EIS or an EA, environmental impact statement or environmental uh, uh, assessment. Uh, the, that's a decision that uh, only the federal uh, government uh, can make. Uh, Central Business District tolling was passed into law in April of 2019. Our first meeting with USDOT was literally a couple of weeks later, and, and we've, met, we've met numerous times, both in Washington and the regional office uh, in, in Albany. 
Uh, we, we think that because of the criticality of central business district tolling to the, to the capital plan, that the, that the US DOT owes us an answer, a, a prompt one. The, the, the other observation I'll make is that central business district tolling congestion pricing is a huge environmental positive for New York City and, and the entire region in terms of both funding mass transit, significant part of the capital plan, reducing congestion and, and improving air quality. And to delay it on a arcane discussion of the environmental process seems uh, both, both inappropriate and counterproductive to the goals of uh, the environmental goals in particular of congestion pricing. Right. And there's one other question I have for you, Pat, before I move to Sarah uh, on to something else. Um, and it's something that came up in the chat here. And, and I think a lot of readers, a lot of the uh, writers are a little worried because they hear of deficits at the MTA. The first, one of the first things that comes to mind is, oh boy, they're going to raise the fare again. They're going to raise the toll again. Is that on the table at this point? We, we have no plans for a pandemic-related fare increase period. So I, I, I can assure your readers and uh, viewers that that is not on the table. All right. Thank you very much. Um, Sarah, yesterday the uh, LAWR rolled out a tra an updated train time app um, where apparently you're, they're able to assist riders in terms of finding a car that is more friendly to social distancing. Um, we were wondering if there's anything in the works on the transit side to come up with a similar plan. You know, I'm extremely jealous of it. Um, so the short <laughs> answer is it's, is it's such a good app and Phil and I have talked about it extensively and I'm grateful to Phil because he um, like ran, you know, full steam ahead into a bunch of brick walls and knocked them all down to make it, I think, a little bit easier for the rest of us. Um, and I commend him for it. Um, we are working on the same thing at Transit. I have no no uh, timeline for you yet on when it'll be ready, but we um, are trying to do the same thing both on the bus side and on the subway side. Um, I mean, look, we this is some. This is um, a piece of what we were talking about in the lead up to phase one, when people are asking, you know, are, um, what are you going to do as people come back to the system? And we talked a lot about the tools that we would like to put into riders' hands so that they can make um, decisions about when to travel and you know when to you know when to wait if they should enter a station later. And one of the things that we were talking about was an app that would deliver information to them about how crowded a station is and how crowded a train is. Um, and so whether you're you know still on the street thinking about entering the station or maybe getting a cup of you know going to get that coffee before you go to work or if you're in the station and you know you know you've got a four train coming and another one three minutes behind it you know, which one do you want to get on and giving you that capacity information about how full that train is, what each car looks like. Um, that's the kind of stuff we're talking about. It's in the works now. Um, you know, these, um, these uh, tools shouldn't be uh, as hard to build as they sometimes um, seem like they are, but we're, the short answer is we're getting there and um, anxiously, anxiously looking forward to that day when we're able to roll it out to riders. Hey right. Rob, can I add something just real quick? Uh, sure. I took the six. I took the 645 Long Island uh, Railroad from Port Washington this morning and tried out the uh, uh, the, the new app, uh, Long Island Railroad Train Time. For those of your readers or viewers who take the uh, Long Island Railroad, and it's really, as Sarah said, it, it's a fantastic, it's a fantastic tool. And I, I walked down the platform and checked cars against the. Uh, uh, against the app, and it's uh, it, it's really cool. Uh, th those of you who are Long Island Railroad uh, uh, commuters, whether regularly or regularly, you ought to check it out and download it. Uh, Apple Store and Google Play. Very good. Get the plug in there. <laughs> um, uh, so, so you know, with regards to overnight closures, uh, it's it's it was historic. It's never happened before in terms of the subways being shut down in its 116 year history. Um, and like you, like Pat mentioned, the the response seems to be that the writers have never seen it cleaner, and it, you know it seems like a very positive thing with that, with that respect, not just in terms of making it safer for the during the pandemic, but also just in general. Um, some would say it might be a long time in coming. Um, the question, I guess, would be for, for both of you guys to address maybe: uh, is this something that's going to remain in place? indefinitely or is this something just going to last us through the pandemic 
sure I can start and then and then Pat can go. Look, what the, the governor has said is that this is these overnight closures will last through the time of the pandemic, which I think makes sense, frankly. Um, you know, it gives us these the ability to surge into the system when there are no riders there. Um, no offense to any of our riders, we love having you in the system, but you would not believe how much easier it is to clean when you're not there. So, um, <laughs> so that that's something that has been has made life easier for our cleaners. It gives us the ability to, you know, uh, make sure that we're cleaning everything multiple times, disinfecting, um, and doing it effectively and efficiently without folks in the system. Uh, it basically gives the system a, a bit of a reset every morning at five o'clock in the morning. Um, and so, look, I don't think we know yet how long these overnight closures um, will last. Um, we are hopeful and um, and would love for there never to be a second wave or a third wave or a fourth wave. Um, we wouldn't be doing our job if we didn't plan for such waves. And so, as I look forward to um, you know, the, the life of this pandemic, I try to make sure that I'm also ready to restart service when that makes sense overnight, but also to, you know, if I have to keep the system closed overnight to continue with cleaning and to make sure that we're being efficient about it, that to be able to prepare for that as well. So I try to make sure that I'm doing both. Okay. Uh, Pat, you want to add anything to that or? Look, the only thing I'd add, uh, completely agree with Sarah, the only thing I'd add is obviously, uh, it has made the job of the NYPD and the City Department of Homeless Services easier in terms of providing medical and mental health services and shelter to the unsheltered. And it doesn't do anybody uh, any good from a, a social or a human point of view for the homeless to be living on the streets or, or in the subways. Uh, and to the extent a significant number of homeless have received shelter and have received services as a result of the overnight closures. That is an additional social positive, in addition to, as Sarah said, allowing each of the stations and cars to be disinfected. Exactly. Um, one, I had a question maybe for the both of you about this. And, you know, Sarah, you touched upon the fact that there always, always of course, there's always the risk that this, we could get a second wave of, of coronavirus. Um, you know, what has the MTA learned here in terms of the in New York City Transit learned uh, that they can build in terms of lessons? What, what can be done in terms of building off of that in case, God forbid, there is a second wave? Would it be merely just reverting to what was done right after the, the pandemic first hit in New York? Or have you guys come up with other strategies that you feel would be, you know, would give the MTA um, a faster response to this, to a second wave? I, I mean, I, I probably could not, even if I had the list of lessons learned in front of me, I probably would take up the remainder of this webinar with, yeah. with what we've learned. Um, so first of all, speaking only for myself, I also um, <laughs> came into this job on, you know, March 2nd or whatever it was. And so oh, that's right. I sort that's, of, that's, my that's exactly lesson- the beginning. My lessons, yeah, my lessons learned are not just, you know, from um, getting, you know, trying to get to the other side of this pandemic, but, you know, being in a new gig. So, so I'm sure my lessons learned are probably beyond everyone else's because they, um, some folks were, sort of had the lay of the land already. And so I've, I've learned, you know, times two. Um, but look, everything from, you know, we've, I think we've learned a lot of lessons about quarantining. I think um, we've learned a lot of lessons about social distancing in our facilities, just like everyone else has. We've learned a lot of lessons about, um, you know, who, who should own um, responsibility for certain pieces of, you know, just running a 74,000 person workforce. For me, a 53,000 person workforce. For Pat, a 74,000 person workforce. Um, you know, I, I mean, unfortunately, there are a whole lot of lessons learned that probably don't have a lot to do with, um, or that do or don't have a lot to do with, with managing a, a massive workforce. I mean, unfortunately, one of the lessons I've learned is um, don't always listen to the first thing the CDC says, right? So when the mm. CDC says, don't give out masks to people unless they're ill and you're literally, you know, moving them from their workplace to the doctor, to the hospital or to their home. They don't need to be wearing a mask. They shouldn't be wearing a mask because they'll only be endangering themselves or, um, or creating a false sense of security. 
you know, unfortunately, one of the lessons learned from all this is that was that was bad guidance. And, um, you know, we we broke with that guidance uh, earlier than I think most people did. But I, of course, I wish we'd, we'd broken with that with it even earlier. Um, so, I mean, it's a great question. Uh, you know, everything from I, I want to have you know, better um, instantaneous contact information for every single one of my employees to what's the best way to quarantine someone and then send them home and then uh, and then figure out when they can come back to work. I think we've we've learned lessons from all of it and um, and they'll serve us well going forward, even if hopefully we never have another wave. We've still learned a lot um, to in preparation for other events. I, I, uh, I'd add three points. One is, uh, first, no, nothing new under the sun, by which I uh, cite the following example. We're asking employers to stagger days and hours of work. We're doing that at the MTA uh, where, where we can. The state of New York did the same thing in the 1918-1919 Spanish flu pandemic, and they did it in part to ease uh, uh, reduce social density, that probably wasn't the term used 100 years ago, but uh, on, on the existing subways. Second is uh, we had the benefit of being able to look at our counterpart transit agencies in Asia and in Europe who entered the pandemic earlier and came out of the pandemic earlier because it started in Asia, went to uh, Europe, and then came to, uh, uh, to North America. And we've been uh, in constant contact with APTA, the Trade Association, uh, American Public Transit Association, UITP, which is the international association, and with transit agencies uh, and public health uh, professionals, including State Department of Health, CDC, uh, uh, Johns Hopkins University, uh, and others, Dr. Brenner at uh, Columbia University. So taking advantage of what other uh, agencies that have already learned. And then the third is, is innovation. Sarah talked about the ultraviolet C pilot, which is going on on subways and buses right now. We talked a minute ago about the new Long Island uh, train time uh, app and other uh, things that we have learned and innovations that we are pursuing, both related to response to the pandemic, uh, as well as just improving uh, customer service. Okay. Um, this question, I guess, would be for both of you. The MTA, the other uh, expected general, had released a report last week about uh, the homeless outreach program. Um, basically, it stated that it's, it was about $7.6 million placed into the program with uh, Bowery Residence Committee and the NYPD to, to move homeless individuals out of the subways. Uh, do you care to re comment on that report? Sure. And its findings? I'm happy to. Look, I... Sure, I'm happy to. I, look, I found the, the um, most helpful piece of the report to be a reiteration and a confirmation from the MTA, MTA IG that this is not something that the MTA should own. You know, we are a transportation agency. It is not our area of expertise to be, um, to be um, you know, deploying social services. Um, it's not appropriate and it's not, it's not fair to this vulnerable population that they should be coming to a transportation agency for social services, you know, you don't go to an airline pilot for a, you know, for your for your doctor's checkup. It doesn't make sense. And so, um, so I, you know, I appreciate the work that the that the IG did. I could not agree more that it's not our area of expertise and it's not the place where we should be, you know, spending our time and our and our precious resources. It's important. We've always been a part of this problem. We've always been a part of this solution because the reality is, is there were moments over the last several years where more than 2,000 people were actually living in our system, taking shelter in our system. That's not fair to them. It's not fair to our riders. It's not fair to our workforce, uh, you know, who are trained and whose job consists of operating a train, not, um, you know, not um, having to deal with folks who are trying to sleep in that train or live in that train. Um, so, look, I, I, you know, my posture with the IG is always going to be, what can I learn from the Inspector General? What can they shed light on that I can use to do my job better? And so I found the, the report to be extremely helpful. Uh, I agree with it and, um, and look forward to doing our small piece of, you know, what we can do to be better partners um, on dealing with this issue. But I, I, I believe strongly that, that managing this issue long term you know, land squarely in the lap of, of the city. Yeah, the, the only thing I'd add to that, right, is that the overnight closures, which were a difficult decision to make, first time in 116 year history in the subways, that uh, uh, there was a planned, uh, you know, nighttime uh, closure for an extended period of time. 
those nighttime closures have allowed the city department of homeless services to be far more effective in providing mm. medical and mental health services as well as shelter and the number of homeless individuals who have received shelter is up substantially uh, and 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 that is the good news but it is fundamentally a social service issue and a responsibility of the city right um one question about you know in the recent weeks the uh, the protests following the, uh, the 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 police involved death of George Floyd uh, they've changed you know quite a bit of opinion regarding law enforcement. I was wondering if the Pat or Sarah if the MTA might be reconsidering its approach to fair evasion enforcement and the hiring of the police officers that uh, came up last year um, in the wake of that uh, in the wake of the Floyd protest. Well, look, as I, as I said before, as a result of the pandemic's effect on our financials, uh, right. everything at the MTA uh, is, is on hold and has to be, has to be reviewed. Uh, and, and that includes, there's a hiring freeze in effect because of the huge, huge negative impact that the pandemic has had uh, on our financials. Uh, approximately 160 officers have been uh, hired uh, so far. Uh, but, uh, you know, as Sarah said uh, the other day, uh, everything is on hold and there is a hiring freeze in effect. But look, I'll just, I'll just say one thing about that, and, and that's to, to just remind you and, and your colleagues that, you know, this, um, this debate has been going on for many months. And we have said repeatedly that hiring additional police officers is not just about fare evasion. Hiring new police officers is about making the system more safer and more secure. And, um, you know, I, I can't say it enough times um, because, but it's really important to understand. Um, and, you know, the MTA police force reports to Pat Foy and, and, and works closely with me and reports to Pat Warren, who's the chief safety and security officer. And that means that we give that police force direction. We don't micromanage them, but we give them direction. And, um, and so I don't know how to be more clear about that, but, um, but I think it's important. Okay. Um, let me just check one more here. Um, oh, Sarah, there is one thing I wanted to bring up. Um, one of the changes that was made during the uh, pandemic was back, back door boarding on some of the buses. Uh, and the, the first couple of rows toward the front near the driver were blocked off. Um, how much longer is that going to be in effect? And uh, is there any, is any, there are any changes in terms of like uh, fare collection at that point? Are fares being collected for those who ride on a bus and have to board through the back instead of the front? Yeah. So first of all, fares are being collected for, um, for SVS buses. Um, but, but to your point, we're actively working on a solution to make sure that we can bring um, that we can bring riders back through the, you know, through all door boarding, not just the back, but to bring right. them through the front as well. Right. Um, so we're actively working on solutions there for a couple of reasons. One, it's just not a long-term solution to only have to move people to one door, right? We want to be able to be more efficient and to use all doors. Second, it doesn't make sense to not be uh, collecting fares. Obviously, particularly given our financial situation, we can't, you know, we can't continue long term to not be collecting those fares. So we have to find a solution. Additionally, you know, the more space that remains between the operator and the riders, I do worry about the ability to social distance at the back for the riders. And so we have to find a way to make sure that we're using as much of the space of the, in the bus as we possibly can. So it's something that we're actively working on. And we are, we are moving as fast as we possibly can to add Omni to all, of, to all buses so that we can um, make that interaction between um, passengers and the, to make that interaction between riders and operators uh, even less and make the um, entire system contactless. Right. That actually leads me to, to the last question uh, for the webinar here uh, with regards to the Omni rollout, which I know is being expedited and moved up to the, you know, to being placed by the end of the year. Um, we've got a lot of questions in recent months from people about, you know, whether, how that's going to impact, you know, those who buy, you know, the Metro car in advance, senior citizens, how that's going to affect them. Um, do you have any insight as to uh, how that's going to change? Sure, I can start, and then you know, sure. um, and I want Pat to jump in. Um, is, is he? Um, 
he's been really the leader on Omni since the beginning. Um, you know, Omni will be in all subway stations and all buses by the end of the year, which is really a phenomenal achievement. Um, that is in spite of, of COVID and, you know, all, all of those folks who install those devices were also impacted by the pandemic. They were home on quarantine, they were homesick. And so being able to get that done by the end of the year is a huge accomplishment. Uh, the Metro cards themselves will be with us for a couple of years beyond that, but we're gonna, I, you know, I can only speak for myself. I'm gonna do as much as I can to push everyone into Omni uh, so that we have this contactless solution and can move forward with, um, with, the, with the appropriate, you know, technologies that sort of take us to the, the next place we wanna be. Yeah, the, the thing I'd add is that one of the principles of Omni is that customers will, as Sarah said, for a couple of years be able to use MetroCards. Following that, they'll be able to use uh, an Omni card. We're going to establish a robust retail system outside the subways where customers will be able to use, uh, able to buy Omni cards at, uh, at drugstores, grocery stores, bodegas, et cetera, because one of the principles of Omni is that you're always going to be able to use cash for those who are unbanked or just prefer to use it. But as Sarah said, Omni has been a critical success with our customers. They love it. Prior to the pandemic, there was substantial growth in Omni use, and obviously when it's in every subway station as it will by the end of the year and on every bus by the end of the year, and as ridership increases, we are very bullish and optimistic about the future of Omni. And in a world where people want more contactless experiences, whether they're buying a cup of coffee, a article of clothing, or the ability to ride on a subway or bus, hmm. contactless uh, experiences are what the bulk of our customers are gonna provide, and that's what Omni provides. All right, that's great. And with that, I wanna thank uh, MTA Chair and CEO Pat Foy and Acting New York City Transit President Sarah Feinberg for joining us and participating. Uh, thank you again, and thanks to all of you for watching. Uh, for latest news, check out amny.com. Thank you and have a hey, Rod, day. thanks. Yeah. Rod, thanks for having us and yeah. thanks for all uh, AM New York does to uh, inform our customers. You're very welcome. Thank you again. Good to be with you all. Thank you. Take care, guys.